Welcome to Math 31. This is the, the second lesson on domain and range. This one is going to concentrate on algebraically determining what the domain and range of a function is. And it can be a little bit more complicated. People tend to struggle with this a bit. So it does take practice, but it is very important. You will be tested on this, and you tend to use these skills throughout uh, the uh, course. Now, the idea with this algebraic um, calculation of domain and range is that you use it on graphs or on functions that you're unfamiliar with. And that's going to happen an awful lot because in some courses you basically get good at um, recognizing basic graphs, you know, quadratics, absolute values, stuff like that. Now that's fine, but when you encounter something that you haven't seen before, so you don't know what it looks like exactly, and when you don't have the means, such as a graphing calculator, to work out what it is, then you have to do it all algebraically, and that's typically what's expected. But there are a few specific methods for it, or method. Generally speaking, to find the domain in the function or the relation, whatever you have, you, your, your first task is to isolate the y variable, and then we look for restrictions on x. Now, Usually, the y will already be isolated, so it's not a big problem. And I'll explain the restrictions part shortly. To find the range, we do kind of the same thing. We isolate the x, and then we look for restrictions on y. Now, with restrictions, generally speaking, they're going to be where we have a square root, or fourth root, or any even root, or the x on the denominator, because these both imply certain things. When we have the square root of x, it means that x has to be greater than or equal to 0. You cannot take the square, or ev if for any even root, you cannot have the radicand um, negative. And then for the second one, the restriction is that x cannot be equal to 0. So that's what we're looking for. So pretty much everything else goes. So if you don't run into those things, you just assume that everything is OK. Now, the other thing is this is not foolproof, particularly with the range. So when we get to the range, we're going to have to go through it very carefully. There's other things to consider. The good news is the domain is more important, ultimately. But uh, temporarily, we will s probably struggle with the range. It takes practice. So let's launch into a few questions. Algebraically, determine the domain and range of the following. Now the first one is just y is equal to x squared, a simple little quadratic. Now many of you do know already what this graph looks like, and if you do, you go directly to the answer. Um, because, well, I'm going to really, really roughly give you a look at this. This is what the quadratic looks like. I'm not bringing up a calculator for it. And by inspection, you can tell that the graph the domain is all real numbers, goes forever left and right, and that the range is greater than or equal to zero. Okay, so we can do it like that. But I'm going to play dumb with it, pretend I don't know, and then I'm going to do the domain as was um, described earlier. So we isolate the y. The y is already isolated, so we have it in the form we want. y is equal to x squared. And then we just look for restrictions. And when I say look for restrictions, I mean again, is there a square root or is there a denominator with x on the denominator? Answer to both of those is that there is no restriction. So we could then go on to say that in interval notation, the domain is negative infinity to positive infinity no restrictions at all. All real numbers. That was easy. So algebraically, could recognize it. The range I'm going to do just below. And this will require a little bit of work. Now I already know the answer, but um, if I want to get this one with the I x isolated, so remember that's always the purpose. You isolate the opposite variable. So I take the square root of x squared, which is just x. And then it means you have to take the square root of the other side. And don't forget, it's got to be plus or minus. When you take the root of both sides, both uh, positive and negative. So we get this situation. And I don't care about the plus or minus, really. All I care about is this radical. And any time I get in that form where it's the square root of a variable, 
we know that the variable has to be greater than or equal to zero. So using interval notation, we would say lower limit of zero with that closed bracket all the way up to positive infinity, like this. And that would be the range. Okay? So we knew the answer, but the method worked anyways. Let's go on to another one. f at x is equal to 2 over x plus 3. Well, in this case, we have a denominator that we need to worry about. <coughs> now, we have it in the right form for the domain. But we see that that denominator, x plus 3, cannot be equal to 0. So therefore, x cannot be equal to negative 3. And I'll write this in interval notation by having the one interval from negative infinity up to negative 3, non-inclusive, in union with the interval from negative 3 forever upwards. So that's the domain, fairly straightforward. The range, a bit more of a problem. That's how you would probably experience a lot of these. The range can be a little more complicated. First off, we have to do a little bit of algebra on this, because the trick is to isolate the x. And I'll write that in terms of y instead of f at x, just to make the math easier. But we will multiply both sides of the equation by x plus 3, there by eliminating our denominator, and that would mean that we get x plus 3 times y is equal to 2. Now, to get the x by itself, we divide both sides by y. So basically, the x's and the y's are changing position. Now, you could stop right there if you wanted. You really do not need to take that 3 over, because even though you're asked to isolate the x, really all you care about is the location and the what's going on with that y. Because when we see it like this, y on the denominator means that y cannot be equal to 0. You cannot have that division uh, of 0. So this means that the range would be from negative infinity, the l this interval, to 0, in union with 0 to positive infinity. Now I'm going to make one other observation about this equation before we go on. And that has to do with the, the, the nature of 2 over x plus 3 as it affects the range. You see, 2 is a positive number, and the denominator cannot be equal to 0, so it might have occurred to you that this cannot be e there's no way that y can be equal to 0 because in order for something to be equal to 0 it has to be 0 on the numerator or 0 divided by something so 2 is already there 2 divided by anything will never be equal to 0 so if you're really shrewd you would have seen that right away and figured hmm i cannot y cannot be equal to 0 and in fact we are going to do that type of observation as we get deeper into this section Let's try a few more, though. So here we have 3 is equal to y, uh, number 3, y is equal to x plus 4. Now your domain, x plus 4, is greater than or equal to 0. So we look right away for at that radical. So x has to be greater than or equal to negative 4. So in interval notation, we would say negative 4 is the lower limit, and onward forever, so plus infinity like that. Now the range, this is where things get interesting. It is not foolproof, the algebra method. So what we're going to have to do is do it algebraically, just like we always have been doing for all two questions. But then we're going to do an observation of the original to get more information. And that's the way it works with the range. So first off, if we were to take this equation and 
isolate the x, we'd square both sides. Now that's part of the problem. Squaring is a risky business. When you square something, you run the risk of taking two things that are not equal and making them equal. And um, so anytime that you do square in an equation, both sides, it always means that you check your answers to see if one of your solutions is extraneous. And the same principle applies here, where we may have, in the innocent attempt to solve this equation or to simplify it, we may have, um, we may have created an untrue statement. And we worry about it later. Because when I look at this, when I isolate x, by inspection, there appears to be no restriction. You can square anything you want. There's no square root there. There is no um, denominator. However, by inspection of original, we have to watch what we're doing. Because this is what we were given. y is equal to the square root of x plus 4. And this is the positive root of x plus 4. So when a square root, this is given to us, meaning that we want, that y can never be negative. You take the square root of no something, and it's written as the positive root. If they'd written, if they wanted the negative values, it would have had to have been written as the negative root of x plus 4. So therefore, we have to conclude from there that y must be greater than or equal to 0. So the actual range is from 0 to positive infinity. And this makes sense when we base it on the graph, because this is what your square root function would look like if you did graph it. I'm not going to bother, um, but this, this is what we would get. Now that is usually considered tricky, but that's the way it works with the range. We have to do the algebra, and then we have to inspect the original graph and see if there's a restriction that is built into that original function. Let's do a couple more. Or more than a couple, but uh, let's do a few more. So here we have y is equal to 3 over negative root x, and this is a good example. If we take a look at the denominator, first off for the domain, now, I don't know what this graph looks like offhand. It's an example of an unfamiliar graph. It's a square root function, but it's also uh, a reciprocal function because x is on the bottom. Now, the fact that x is a square root tells me that x must be greater than or equal to 0. However, x cannot be equal to 0 because you cannot have the 0 on the denominator. So, in fact, the domain must be non-inclusive for 0. So we have to alter our domain considering that that is on the denominator, that it, the x is located in the denominator. And then the range. I'm going to do the same thing as I did for the previous one. I'm going to balance two things. Now, when I see it first off for the range, I um, isolate the x, so I will multiply both sides by negative square root x. So negative root x, y is equal to 3. And negative root x is therefore equal to 3 over y. Now really, you could stop there because we have the y where we want it. But if you want to do it by the book, you square both sides. So negative root x squared is equal to 3 over y all squared. This gives you just plain x, the negative, when you square it goes away, is equal to 9 over y squared. And this is even better, because we can tell from here that y, because it's on the denominator, y cannot be equal to 0. But the question is, do we have any other restriction? And this is where we have to be by inspection of the original. And in fact, we do have another restriction. So by inspection, 
y is equal to 3 over negative root x. If you take a look at that equation, there is a restriction built into it, and it has to do with the sign. 3 is a positive number. It will always be positive. And then the negative root of x must be negative. So therefore, y has to be negative. There's no other possibility. So the range, well, we already know it cannot be 0, but we can go further than that. It has to be all the numbers that are below 0. So negative infinity to 0 becomes the range. So that's how those ones work. They can be a problem. Now I'm going to stop right there and I'm going to do more domain and range questions on the next little video clip. On your handout, on the notes for this one, numbers 5 and 6 particularly you might want to try before we go into the next ones and then I will finish it off and then assign the homework after that. So thank you for your time. I will talk to you later.